2011. Uh, and the Breakthrough Prize is designed to encourage, you know, and really to make movie stars out of, out of scientists. Uh, and it, uh, we give uh, uh, six or seven, three million US dollar prizes each year. That's about three times uh, uh, the amount of some Swedish prize I'm not supposed to mention. Uh, so we are competing a little bit with them, but we, 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 we have a number of people that won both prizes. Uh, and these are given in fundamental physics, mathematics and life sciences. We also have an early career prize in, uh, uh, for uh, people within a, a decade of their final degree. Uh, and then we have uh, another prize I'm going to tell you because I'm kind of excited about it, uh, largely because I chair the selection committee. Uh, but the Breakthrough Prize is, uh, it, it was given in person until COVID uh, at the campus of NASA Ames Research Center where I was the center director. And uh, it's, it's, it's now called the, the uh, Oscars of Science. And it's a really glitzy affair. You know, it's, you know, first run movie stars and entertainers and, and, and billionaires. And uh, uh, it's the only black tie affair in Silicon Valley. Uh, I have to tell you, it took us a while to explain to Sergey Brin that black tie wasn't black t-shirt. Uh, but we, we, we finally seen him in, in, uh, in, in black tie. Uh, but it's, 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 it's a really neat event. Uh, the, uh, this is from a few years ago. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's broadcast live uh, the, uh, on, uh, on Nat Geo and uh, uh, often on Discovery Channel. Uh, it's pretty entertaining. Uh, you know, again, this year, because of COVID and the world affairs, we're, we, we're just doing the prize virtually. Uh, but hopefully in the next year or so, we'll be able to restart it. Now, since it was on the campus of NASA Ames, uh, and I was the center director, there's an old thing that if you're a, uh, saying that if you're going to have a big party, invite the landlord. And so I was invited, and uh, you know I managed to you know the to to fit into an old tux after it sort of expanded a bit. Uh, but uh, it's a really cool ceremony, and and one of the things I want to highlight to uh, this is a. Uh, 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 Jocelyn Bell Burnell, yes. <laughs> I, I was reading this thing and I had it wrong. Uh, Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell. And uh, those of you that uh, might know about her history is, is uh, in, the, uh, in the 1960s, she was a graduate student at Cambridge University. And uh, they had some of the early radio telescopes and she noticed this signal that was repeating very rapidly every, every few seconds. And uh, uh, she told her advisors that they said, oh, that's rubbish, ignore it. And I'm going to talk more about signals in, in, in radio uh, sources. But she, uh, uh, she didn't ignore it. Uh, she did call it LGM, which stood for Little Green Men 1. Uh, and uh, she eventually was able to show that it was real, it was real data. It was the first pulsar. And... Uh, uh, a really fundamentally significant discovery, uh, except that, that uh, although she was a co-author on the paper, uh, the Nobel Prize was given to her advisors, not to her. And it was quite a slight, so uh, a few years ago we gave a special breakthrough prize in fundamental physics to, uh, to Jocelyn uh, Bell Burnell. Uh, and to her very great credit, she took the three million dollars and she put it in a fund for underserved uh, people, particularly women, to do graduate study. So, I, uh, if if you ever get a chance to meet her, she's a, she's a really neat person. Uh, the the final prize before I actually get into the meat of my talk is the is the Breakthrough Junior Challenge. Uh, this is a prize we give to 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 teenagers, uh, between the age of, ages of thirteen and eighteen. Uh, it's a global prize. Uh, we ask uh, uh, these young people to do a, a couple minute video on some principle in basic science, uh, in, uh, in, in mathematics, uh, physics, uh, or life sciences. Uh, the winner gets a $250,000 scholarship. And uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, school gets a $150,000 laboratory. And to me, the coolest thing is the teacher that inspired the student gets a $50,000 check. Uh, although I have to say the first year we did this, the young man that got the prize had forgot to tell the teacher he nominated him. 
And so when we called up uh, the teacher and said, where do we send your check? He asked, is, is this for real? Is, it, <laughs> is this a con job? And uh, we finally persuaded him, no, we we're going to give him the prize. But it's been a really a global effort. Uh, we've had, uh, uh, in fact, there's actually more women that have won it than men. Uh, we've had people from the, the U.S., uh, Peru, Philippines, Singapore, uh, India, uh, Canada, and this last year, Mauritius. So it's it's really a, a neat effort. So I encourage you, to all the, the countries you're in, if you have no young people, ask them to apply. Well, what I'd like to talk about is the initiatives. And this is, a, uh, the initiatives were, were, were done in, in 2015, announced at the, Royal, at the Royal Society in London. Uh, it was announced by uh, Yuri Milner, our founder. Uh, and you also see Stephen Hawking on the stage. Uh, Professor Hawking was our <clears throat> principal science advisor until he passed away a few years ago. Uh, but the whole purpose of these efforts, which uh, are now have, have several hundred million dollars uh, dedicated to them, is to address the fundamental questions of life. And you know, I'm pleased to see that that one of the uh, one of the TPs is is focused uh, on particularly on the question of life, and and uh, I think this is one of the most exciting questions uh, in all of science. And there's really three fundamental questions, and I'll I'll go over each of these, but particularly focusing on the nearby star systems. The first one is is there intelligent life anywhere other than Earth? Now that begs the question: Is there intelligent life here? And. Uh, <laughs> Usually my answer is the closer you are to a national capital, the less likely to find it. So, but <laughs> but I, I guess Lisbon is the capital, so I shouldn't be quite so. The uh, uh, I gave this talk once in Washington, D.C., and that wasn't well received. But, but uh, uh, the, the second question, is there any life elsewhere? And just to remind everybody, we don't know of any life uh, uh, other than Earth. And the one that I'm most excited about, and you heard from, from my colleague Sonny White uh, a week ago, is can we travel between the stars or we can, can we send probes there? And I'll talk about each of those. Now, the first program, which we've uh, uh, I've just about completed our first phase of, is called Breakthrough Listen. And this is a effort to find a uh, what's called a techno signature some evidence of an alien technological civilization. Uh, and the idea is that, you know, that life itself may be harder to determine, but if it was technological, you might be able to see it much more distantly. And uh, this is an effort that really started in the late 50s. Uh, but uh, we have now re-emphasized this effort, uh, uh, you know, with a lot of money and a lot of support around the world. We have uh, collaborations at most of the world's major radio observatories and some of the world's major optical observatories. Uh, it's currently uh, uh, managed uh, out of the University of California at Berkeley, but we're about to open a major new uh, effort uh, in the UK. So that, you know, stay tuned to that one. Uh, as I noted, there's, uh, there, there's a lot of significant, uh, significant programs, but I want to point out uh, uh, Two in particular that are new uh, on this on this chart uh, in the upper uh, your upper right hand corner is the the first part of the world's largest or that would eventually be the world's largest radio telescope. This is the Meerkat array in South Africa, eventually part of the Square Kilometer array, and then here in the in the the bottom is uh, the world's current largest radio telescope, the the 500 meter in in China. Uh, and we have some interesting results from the, that I, I can talk about from that that uh, the telescope. Uh, again, we've got a lot of other programs around the world, both optical and radio telescopes, and we're starting to use uh, spacecraft. Uh, in this case, the TESS uh, NASA's TESS mission uh, to to begin to look at look for signals. Uh, the as I noted, the the you know the next decade or two, a two thousand radio uh, telescopes are going to be put in Southern Africa. Uh, that'll be the equivalent of a square kilometer of collection. Uh, this is a very exciting effort. Now, one of the things, if you study SETI or techno signatures, you know, people say, well, we've been broadcasting for, you know, you know, uh, over half a century. 
uh, transmissions into space. In fact, when I was a kid, they used to say, well, they, we were broadcasting I Love Lucy. And uh, if you've seen it, it's probably not worth listening. But uh, it turns out that this is the first telescope that's sensitive enough that if they were broadcasting I Love Gork from the, uh, from the Alpha Centauri system, we could pick it up. Uh, so it, it, that shows you that, that sort of these broadcast signals are pretty weak. Uh, but this is a very exciting effort. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about this radio telescope. This is the Parkes Radio Telescope. It's a 65-meter dish in uh, New South Wales in Australia. Uh, it's one of the oldest radio telescopes in the world, and it's actually a very historic uh, antenna. Uh, this is the radio telescope that received the moonwalk uh, signals in, 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 in 1969. Uh, there's a really lovely Australian movie called The Dish, uh, if, you, if you haven't seen it, uh, it's a family movie, so you can invite everybody to come and see it. Uh, I love it. And uh, uh, th th there's a really cool scene where they play cricket inside the dish. So uh, please watch it. Uh, at any rate, about uh, uh, two years ago, or a little over two years ago, uh, I got a call from uh, the principal investigator of the program, and it turned out it was on Halloween. The, the 31st of October, and he said, I think we have a signal. And uh, so after, you know, opening a bottle of champagne and then another one, I uh, said, yes, yes, you know, I, I promised the, 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 you know, the, the rich people that we'd do something interesting. Uh, the, uh, we, we knew we had a lot more work to do. Now, this is an interesting question about if we found something, would it be kept secret? I mean, everybody thinks governments keep secret stuff. And we found out very quickly because we told that there was a team of about 15 scientists that now look, any of you say anything until we're ready to publish this, you know, you're going to be in a lot of trouble and, and you know, we'll cut your money and do our horrible things. Uh, it didn't take long, <laughs> like two days uh, before this newspaper article per occurred says, yes, scientists have found aliens. Uh, so, you know, again, I don't think anybody can keep this stuff secret very long, but let me talk about this signal. Uh, this is it here on the, uh, you know, on, on your left. Uh, this is what's called a waterfall diagram. And, and what it is is it's, it's a scan uh, of uh, the, the power is a, is a, and the signal is this yellow streak in the center there. Uh, versus frequency, so the power is the, the brighter the color is. In this case, it's a yellow streak and a green background. Uh, and this, the the little kind of bars are where they've taken the radio telescope and lock, rocked it off and on the source. The interesting thing is this source is Proxima Centauri, which is the very nearest star, which is I'm going to tell you in a bit, <clears throat> has an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone. So we said, yes, yes, we not only found aliens, but they're right nearby. Uh, however, after the next six, eight weeks of actually really careful work, uh, we found that there were signals like this in other, you know, some other objects. And this only lasted for a couple of days. We now are pretty convinced this was interference from a terrestrial source. Uh, but it did get a lot of attention. We had two papers in Nature Astronomy, and if, if you're in science, if you get your your paper published in Nature, it's like being on the front page of Rolling Stone as a rock star. Uh, so, you know, everybody involved, you know, can now put this in their list. They have Nature publications. They can get tenure and, and other things, or, or at least keep being wor keep working. Uh, at any rate, this was, this was a pretty exciting effort. Uh, one of the things you look for is that the signal is very narrow in frequency. Natural sources, as far as we know, are not narrow frequency. Uh, in addition, it drifts in frequency, which says it's not on the Earth. And uh, now in this case, we think it was, it was an electronic problem in the electronics, or it could have been a signal bouncing off a satellite. Uh, but it was pretty exciting. Now, I mentioned the Chinese radio telescope. A couple of weeks ago, there was a, a, a similar claim from the Chinese that... Uh, uh, and it turned out that that, that was a joint effort between uh, the Berkeley people and the Chinese scientists. And all of the Chinese scientists and the Berkeley people believed it was not a real signal. And actually, it was less real than this one. But one of the scientists decided he wanted to blab to the newspapers. And so it took a while to kind of get this 
you know, toned down. So, I mean, this is a, a very exciting area, but it's, uh, I think the important thing to say is we haven't found anything yet. The problem is it's very, very difficult to, to, to find a real signal because we're in a, in basically a blizzard of radio noise from your cell phones, from radio transmitters, from cars, from any other machines, including in space. So one of the ideas, and, and this is a, a very exciting one, is there's one place pretty close by, just on the other side of the moon, uh, which is completely shielded from the Earth and the interference. Uh, unfortunately, we're beginning to see, you know, people put satellites in lunar orbit to do communications. So what we'd like to do is have a shielded area on the far side of the moon that is preserved for radio, uh, 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 receiving radio signals that we can check for SETI, but also signals that would represent the various earliest phases of the universe, the, the extreme low frequency signals. Uh, this has become urgent enough that uh, the International Astronautical uh, uh, or Ac International Academy of Astronautics has uh, started a working group to figure out how can we protect this with future UN agreements. So it's this very important thing uh, of, of protecting this, this uh, scientific capability. Well, let me now turn to the primary topic, the star system Alpha Centauri. Uh, the system itself, it consists of three stars. Uh, and, you know, the, if you like science fiction, you read the, the Chinese three-body problem, which, by the way, is an interesting concept, but the Alpha Centauri system does not look at all like that system. It's not a chaotic system. Uh, it has two stars that are about the size of the sun, one a little bigger and one a little smaller, uh, that orbit each other in a, in fact, you can see the, the, uh, the sizes here, uh, in about 80 years. In fact, if you were sitting on a planet like Earth orbiting one of these stars, the other one would be, you know, about where the planet Uranus is. So they're, they're, they're not that close, uh, but it would be pretty, pretty bright. I mean, the nighttime wouldn't be very dark if, if that, uh, if you were on that side of the, of the, of your star. The, there's a third star that's very far away. That's uh, Proxima Centauri. And, uh, in fact, it's, uh, uh, it takes several hundred thousand years to orbit the other one. It's, it's uh, 10,000 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun away from the other two stars. Uh, and it's a red dwarf. What a red dwarf is, is about a tenth the mass of the Sun, about a ten thousandth of the brightness, except there's about uh, uh, you know seventy percent of all stars are red dwarfs. So it's a very exciting system. Uh, it's in the southern hemisphere. Those of you that live in the southern hemisphere, it's the second brightest star in the sky. Uh, the uh, by the way, those of you who live in the southern hemisphere are really lucky because we're looking towards the center of the galaxy. There's twice as many stars. It's much cooler. Uh, I wish I was born in the southern hemisphere. The, uh, uh, we, we announced uh, a major program to send a probe there, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, but when we decided that we wanted to send a probe there, we didn't know of any planets in the, in the Alpha Centauri system. This was in, uh, uh, on April 12th in 2016. Uh, but uh, about three months later, the European Southern Observatory announced that they had detected indirectly a planet orbiting the small star, Proxima Centauri. And it seems to be about the size of the Earth, and it's in the habitable zone. So if there was liquid water on the surface, it would stay liquid. Uh, so this is pretty exciting. Uh, the, uh, they were nice enough to invite me to their press, re their press conference. You can, you can see me looking a lot younger over there, less gray hair. Uh, and so we were nice enough to give them several million dollars to go check this out, uh, the system. But uh, by the way, this is the, the, uh, uh, an artist's conception of what the, the surface of the star might look like or the planet might look like. You can see the, the red dwarf star, which would, would, would be about six, eight times bigger in the sky than the sun. Uh, and you see the double stars in the distance, Alpha Centauri A and B. Uh, we don't have the slightest idea what this looks like, although when I showed this to our sponsor, he says, well, I guess we don't have to go there now. We have a picture. Uh, but uh, uh, it, this is, is becoming a very interesting system because the way they detect these is they look at the, at the Doppler motion of the, of the star, the, 
it's movement back and forth, uh, and they find periodicities in it. Uh, and it turns out that that when they discover this one, they discovered another planet that's you know pretty far out. I mean, not far out as far as our solar system is concerned, but but in a much colder orbit, it had something like a six month period. Uh, however, here a few months ago, there's a third star in the system that also appears to be in the habitable zone. And by the way, the orbit of, uh, and the first one was called Proxima B, and uh, its orbit was 11 days, so your year would be 11 days. Uh, this one had about a six day period, but this is a really interesting question because are these habitable or they have they bear life? And a lot of people say, well, it's unlikely they would bear life because if you do a physics calculation, you show that if a if a, a planet orbits a much bigger object, uh, that uh, it would be the, the the it would be phase locked. So one side, like the moon is to the Earth, and I, and that means one side would bake and the other side would freeze. Except if you have multiple planets, they are what's called resonance locked, which means that that they're locked to each other and the star. Uh, for example, in our solar system, Mercury and Venus uh, should be phase locked to the sun, but they're actually because of each other and the Earth, they're resonance locked. So they, you know, Venus actually, you know, shows different faces to the sun as does Mercury. So uh, these things might be, uh, might be, uh, uh, might be, uh, uh, habitable after all. Now, this is the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope, VLT, uh, and we. This is what we did with the with the uh, 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 with them. We put an instrument on the on the telescope at the right, imaginatively named number four, uh, and we had a hundred hours of observations with a special instrument that blocked out the star, but in this case we weren't looking at Proxima, we were looking at Alpha Centauri A and B, the solar type stars. Uh, now I have to pause here, and, and I'm an astronomer and I'm embarrassed about this, but we're not very good at naming things. Uh, this was the very large telescope, and uh, uh, the European Southern Observatory is building a 39 meter telescope, which is called the Extremely Large Telescope. And it turns out that I'm not kidding. Initially, it was supposed to be like twice that size, but they had a budget cut. It was going to be called the overwhelmingly large telescope. So uh, I, I think they need a little more ISU kind of, you know, where there's people that understand, you know, how you communicate with the public. And and uh, but uh, at any rate, the, 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 this is an exciting, uh, exciting measurement. Now, I put this picture up. Uh, a lot of you may recognize. How many are science fiction fans like I am? Okay, you, what, what's this picture from? Oh, no, come on now. Avatar, yes. Oh, yeah, I didn't mean, you should shout louder. Uh, the 2009 movie was Avatar. What we found from our data, that there appears to be a giant planet orbiting Alpha Centauri A, in Avatar, there's a giant planet orbiting Alpha Centauri A in the habitable zone, and it has moons. Now, we don't know whether there's moons around this thing, but it's uh, uh, and actually in that case, the, the moon is not only habitable, but it's inhabited. Uh, but this is very exciting. And uh, it turns out Yuri Milner knows uh, James Cameron pretty well. So we got in touch with James Cameron. And so at our annual conference, he gave us about an hour tour de force on you know, this movie and what they were trying to do. He, he was busy filming Avatar 2, 3, and 4 in New Zealand. Uh, but uh, what's interesting, and to keep this in mind, is there's a starship there. It's a, it's, a, it's a human starship. And so we asked him, how is it propelled? And he said, well, it was propelled with lasers. And uh, you know, I'm giving away how we're going to try to do it. But at the other end, it uses fusion to stop. And uh, uh, so, I mean, it turns out, I think that's probably how we might actually get humans to the next star system. And I, that's sort of giving away my bottom line. Uh, at any rate, uh, we want to confirm that, uh, that this is a planet. It's, it's a three sigma result for those of you in sciences, that's marginal. I mean, it, it's believable. Uh, so we need to get 
better data. This is a mission that's privately funded that will be launched in about two years. It's called the, the Taliban mission. Uh, and it's managed for us by the University of Sydney. And uh, the, the spacecraft is built in Bulgaria by Endurosat. Uh, and the uh, instrument is being provided by JPL. So it's a very internationally uh, done program, privately funded. And uh, uh, I won't get into the details of how it works, but it basically looks at one star in the Alpha Centauri system of the, the, of the two bright ones, measures its position very precisely relative to the other. And over a few years, we'll see a small wobble that'll tell us not only prove there's a planet there, and we think we can see down to Mars-sized planet, but it, it'll tell us the mass. So we begin to get more information. Uh, we're also looking at the 61 Cygni system, which is another nearby star system. Uh, Alpha Centauri is 4.3 light years away, which is right next door. It's only 300,000 times further away than the sun. So, you know, a piece of cake. Uh, the, uh, the, the 61 Cygni system is about two and a half times further away. And it consists of two solar type stars orbiting each other. So we may get some more data here pretty soon. Now, how are we going to get there? Uh, well, as, uh, as I noted on the, on the 12th of April 2016, which was the anniversary of the, uh, of the, of the uh, first human spaceflight, uh, by the way, Yuri Milner was named after Yuri Gagarin, so he had a real affection for this. Uh, we uh, announced Breakthrough Starshot, and this was done at the New World Trade Center in New York. You can see uh, Mr. Milner and, and, and Professor Hawking. But uh, also on stage are other people that are, are very uh, interested in interstellar flight. Uh, Freeman Dyson, uh, who's since passed away. Uh, Andrew Yen, who is Carl Sagan's widow and the creator of the Cosmos series. Uh, Professor Ave Loeb, who I'll talk more about, who is, is an incredibly bright but somewhat uh, controversial guy. Uh, Mae Jemison, who was an astronaut, who runs a... a uh, a sister organization looking for interstellar flight, and then there's some geeky guy looking geeky in that picture. Uh, now, going to the Alpha Centauri system, how fast do you have to go to get there in a reasonable amount of time? Well, it's about a thousand times faster than we go today. It's two tenths the speed of light. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we set some study plans up under uh, Professor Loeb. And uh, uh, can we go a thousand times faster? Uh, and can we do it, you know, sometime later this century? And the first reaction was uh, like, you've got to be kidding. Uh, and we had a couple objectives we gave him. We said uh, we'd like to determine if there are life-bearing planets in the Alpha Centauri system and the Proxima system. We want to take science data uh, and we want to, you know, send it back to the Earth, and we'd like to launch within a few decades, and we want to do it at an affordable price. Now, I don't know what an affordable price is, uh, except billionaires have a few tens of billions, and governments have a few trillions. So we want to do it in billionaire levels of dollars, not or euros or whatever, uh, and not, uh, uh, you know, government levels. Now, it turns out that after we looked at this, uh, there's a very old idea, uh, and this is a letter from Kepler to Galileo in 1610, and where he says we should sail on heavenly winds. Now, we're not exactly sure what he meant, but, but we're claiming it's what we're doing. Uh, the idea here is to build a very small satellite, a, a chipset, uh, which weighs a few grams. Uh, we want to leave the engine to push this on the Earth, uh, and uh, we want to attach this chip to a sail, a light sail, and, and the laser beam and the light pressure is the wind. Uh, now this is a, you know, light sailing is, and I'm going to talk a little more about it, but it's a very exciting uh, new effort. It's been demonstrated by a couple spacecraft. Uh, uh, the first one was uh, privately funded by the Planetary Society. Uh, and then the Japanese and their Ekeros probe used it to, and it turned out it kind of saved the mission, it helped them get in orbit around Venus. Uh, the trouble is sunlight isn't powerful enough to push us all the way to, you know, to 20% the speed of light, although I will talk that sunlight can do really, really well. Uh, the, uh, the satellite itself is actually 
you know, it says, you, you mean you can put a whole satellite on, on a few grams? Well, if you have an electronic watch, uh, the chip in that watch is, uh, is very similar to, to a satellite. It does just about everything a satellite does. Uh, so a couple of years ago, this is, this by the way, is Professor Zach Manchester. He's now at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, when he was a graduate student at Cornell University, he started something called uh, Kicksat. And so he built, you know, with some other students, they built these little chips and chipsats. And, uh, you know, when he came to us at NASA Ames and we helped him launch them and uh, we got in a lot of trouble because, you know, the government doesn't like these. They call them space debris. Uh, but uh, the era of Graham class satellites is upon us. Uh, and there's, I'll, I'll talk a little more about some efforts there. Now, one of the other challenges, I think one of the biggest challenges is, is the laser uh, photon engine. Uh, the amount of energy you need when you do the, ca the calculations is you need about 100 gigawatts of power for a few tens of minutes. Uh, that, uh, and the, the laser has to be kilometer scale. Uh, but we've done a lot of work that, that says we think we can do this in the next few decades for an affordable price. Uh, the, uh, so this is kind of an artist's conception of what the array would look like. Uh, the, uh, this is a, a, a picture of it firing. Now, I showed this to Mr. Milner, and remember, he's a physicist. And he looked at me and he said, you know, he didn't say bullshit, but that's what he was meaning. And, and uh, I said, what do you mean? He said, you're a physicist. This is, what wavelength of light are you using? And I said, one micron. He said, well, you wouldn't see one micron. And uh, so I was quick on my feet and I said, well, you might heat, heat dust particles in the atmosphere and they'll glitter a little bit. And he said, all right, but fix it, which we haven't fixed it yet. Uh, but the, uh, you know, this is an artist's conception of it firing against the sail. It would be maybe 10 meters in diameter. You, you, you put these sail craft, you have a mothership that's in a highly elliptical orbit with its uh, apogee about 60,000 kilometers. Uh, and uh, aimed with the, the axis aimed towards Alpha Centauri. Uh, every few orbits, you would, you would launch a chip and erect the sail and then hit it for maybe an hour. Uh, it accelerates pretty fast, like a few tens of thousands of Gs, but uh, we, we, uh, satellites can survive that, by the way. There's a satellite company doing a similar thing with a centrifuge called uh, Spin Launch that uh, has already shown they can do that in California. But it's uh, 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 it's a pretty neat uh, it's a pretty neat project. Uh, now the interesting thing is where would you put this uh, this light or this uh, photon engine? Uh, and it turns out because we're going to Alpha Centauri, which is sixty one degrees south declination, it has to be in the southern hemisphere, and you want it at high altitude, a very dry site. And it turns out the perfect sites are in the Atacama Desert in Chile. So when we made this announcement. The, uh, you know, the press asked the, the group of us sitting on that table, where would we put this? And so I was the one that raised my hand and said, in Chile. And uh, uh, it turned out we had neglected to ask the Chilean government. Uh, so, so I have since had an interview with two presidents of Chile who were very nice. Uh, and they both said, thank you. We're very interested in doing this, but please ask us next time before you announce you're going to put, you know, giant things in our country. Uh, so that's a message, you know, when you do things, ask, you know, national leaders, they tend to like to be asked. Now, there's some really big challenges to this. Uh, you know, to get the laser through the atmosphere, uh, we think we've solved that. The sailcraft and building the sail, we think we've solved that. And I'll talk about some near-term applications. Uh, communications, this is the hardest one. Uh, you put a small laser on the sailcraft and then use the sail itself to focus it back on the Earth after it flies by the planets in the, in the, in the Alpha Centauri system. Uh, and we need to get the laser sources down to literally a penny a watt. They're at about $10 a watt today, but we think there are ways to do that. Uh, this is a artist conception that, uh, that uh, Andrewian had made for the uh, uh, National Geographic. And this sort of shows the sailcraft going by a hypothetical planet, say Proxima B. Uh, now, they don't all arrive at the same time, but the, you know, for, art, for art's sake, they are shown here. But what's interesting about this, you see there are holes in those. And uh, there's dust in interstellar space. 
And uh, so a lot of these aren't going to survive. They'll probably get hit by dust. There'll be holes in the sails. So uh, we we're going to send hundreds of them. So it's not just one. Well, let me move on to some other questions. First of all, is there life in our own solar system? And uh, we have a couple programs looking for this. These are the five major places that people are talking about. And in fact, if you're in the in the in the science discussion the other day or, or, or yesterday, uh, these were the the five that people have talked about. Uh, Enceladus, uh, the one of the sort of ice worlds, uh, uh, Europa. Uh, Titan, uh, which I think is kind of very interesting, uh, Mars, but to my mind, the most interesting one is the one that's not talked about much is Earth's evil twin, Venus. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Professor Aaron Frank will argue with me on this one, whether there's life there or not, right? Oh, I wish I possible. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's a good, good scientist answer. Uh, but uh, uh, several years ago, there was a reported discovery of phosphine in the atmosphere of, of Venus. That's a big argument whether it's there or not. Uh, but it, there's something funny going on at about 50 kilometers above the surface. Now, the interesting thing at 50 kilometers above the surface is the temperature and pressure is about the same as it is in this room. Now, there's a minor problem that's in the middle of pure sulfuric acid clouds. Uh, but there are some people that believe there are ways that, that life can survive there. Uh, but uh, uh, the only way to really find this out is go there. Uh, fortunately, there's a privately funded effort in the next couple of years that is going to send a probe there by Rocket Lab. Uh, we are looking at putting an instrument, uh, what's called a laser nephilometer on this. It will enter the, Mar the Venusian atmosphere and we will look for these, uh, uh, these, uh, these molecules and, and others to if, see if there's whatever's going on, there's something interesting at that level in the atmosphere. Uh, about 30% uh, of the ultraviolet radiation that hits Venus gets absorbed at that layer, so we don't know what's causing that. Uh, now, let me talk about light sails. Uh, there's another, you know, there's an early application of light sails. It turns out if you, if you use a light sail and you send even a very small spacecraft, a few tens of kilograms, uh, to a C3 of zero, so it's sort of in the cislunar uh, space, and you unfurl these sails, they catch the sunlight and you can begin to slow the spacecraft so that it, uh, it falls towards the sun. And uh, now the closer you can get to the sun, you orient the sails so as they get closer, they can pick up sunlight. And a small spacecraft uh, that may cost a few tens of millions, we think we can accelerate to five to 10 astronomical units a year by going two tenths of an astronomical unit, that's 25 suns. But the closer you can get, you can get even faster. Uh, we think the technology we have today, you could get a spacecraft to, you know, uh, maybe five hundredths of an AU, in which case you could get 30 to 50 astronomical units a year. So this may give us rapid access to the entire solar system. The TP people are looking at Saturn might want to look at this technology of, of how to get there quickly. Uh, so there is a major program now. Uh, over the last few months, we, our foundation and others have sponsored a series of workshops. The, the next one uh, uh, will be in Croatia here in a few weeks, and then at the IAC we'll have more meetings. Now, I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but can we go to Alpha Centauri? And you, you heard uh, uh, Dr. White tell you about things he's doing, and we're working closely with them. There's two things that are very exciting. One is the, is the fusion systems, <clears throat> and uh, uh, they're funding an effort uh, called that's a fusion engine, and there's about three or four others called Helicity uh, Space. And uh, the interesting thing about fusion is a if you have a conventional chemical engine, it's specific impulse. The sort of measure of efficiency is maybe 400. Uh, if you do the calculations, if you want to build a rocket-sized thing that goes to Alpha Centauri, you need a specific impulse of a million. So, you know, factor of, you know, a few thousand off. Now, an electric propulsion system will give you a few thousand. Uh, a fission system that has, uses nuclear fission can get a hundred thousand. But fusion, in principle, can get half a million. So you're starting to get close. Uh, I think you're going to see in the next decade fusion uh, probably work. Uh, 
by the way, if you watch The Expanse, it does work. Uh, and uh, so it, I, I think that's very exciting. And of course, Limitless Space, uh, Sonny White's foundation is looking at this in light sails and even more exotic things. Now, I, I'd like to close with an interesting discussion of, uh, this is Professor Avi Loeb, uh, and the question is, do the stars come to us? Now, uh, a, uh, about a year and a half ago, he published a book called Extraterrestrial, and uh, he claims, I don't necessarily agree, but he's a friend of mine, so I usually have drinks with him and, and tell him maybe you need some more data, uh, that uh, Oumuamua, the first interstellar asteroid, was actually an alien light sail, just like we were trying to do. Now, he makes an interesting case, so I suggest reading the book, uh, but that's not what I wanted to talk about. I want to talk about that kind of neat picture that he gave me here on the right uh, of, of a meteor hitting the ocean. Uh, it turns out that uh, uh, in 2014, a meteor hit, uh, you know, weighed maybe 500 kilograms, hit uh, near Papua New Guinea. And uh, uh, it was kind of strange because it, it had a very bright flash. Uh, it indicated it's probably a metal, and uh, uh, but it, it clearly came in a very high velocity. Uh, it turns out the U.S. military has a number of sensors that track this stuff. And uh, as luck would have it, one of my former students is uh, the senior space guy at the White House. And although I don't have any clearances anymore, he does. And so he arm twisted the, the, uh, the, you know, the or persuaded the uh, the military to help on this and they were able to confirm this is an interstellar meteorite it's uh, clearly came from from outside our solar system uh so it's uh, uh it's pretty exciting this is the first confirmed hit uh of an interstellar meteor uh, meteorite uh and it appears to have been a, a, a metal uh and we're able to we think narrow down its location to a few kilometers where it hit near the ocean now it, it it probably vaporized and recondensed into little droplets. Uh, but uh, uh, Professor Loeb is leading an effort that I'm involved in. Uh, hopefully next year, we're gonna send out a, a, uh, an expedition where we can have magnetic <laughs> sensors to, see there's one right there, that, 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 uh, that we can sweep the bottom of the ocean and we think we can pick up uh, some of these little medical, metal particles. And uh, so I think it's pretty exciting stuff. It's, you know, it, it shows you can do, uh, thanks that. Uh, the, uh, the, the last question here is, uh, and, and, and I've got a bad word on here. I, I, I should have taken this off. Uh, what, what's a better word than, what's a better word than that? You know, we had a, a conference and it was suggested panovaria was better. So, uh, just pan life. How's that? Uh, that life came from elsewhere. And there's, there's, this is another movie, uh, that you probably all, uh, Prometheus, I think it was, that suggested that life on Earth came from from uh, uh, elsewhere. And this is a interesting theory that's held by a minority of astrobiologists. But we had a little conference on this about three, four years ago at Harvard. And, uh, you know, there wasn't any conclusion on that, although Professor Loeb was quite explicit that he thought that's where life came from. Uh, but there's this guy. Uh, this is uh, Professor George Church at, at Harvard. Uh, now, I like this because he looks like God, or I imagine God looked like when I was a little kid. And uh, and uh, but uh, Church is uh, is one of the world's leading geneticists, and uh, uh, he uh, he's trying to resurrect woolly mammoths. Uh, if you give him his company a thousand dollars, they'll give you a you know full DNA readout. Uh, but uh, when he came to this conference, he said, look, I don't know whether life came from elsewhere here, but he said, we can send our life elsewhere using these chipsats. And uh, uh, so this was a, a very interesting question. And uh, there, there is a, a company that Professor Loeb and I are on the board of called Copernicus that's looking at using really small chipsats that we could send in the tens of thousands to look for life, but it may also be possible to spread life. Uh, now, uh, uh, you know, maybe later this century we'll find an interesting planet around the nearby star system. But the more interesting question here, which this raises, is the, uh, is, is the sort of the ethics of, of human 
spreading our life elsewhere, whether it's in our solar system or beyond. And we, we before the COVID, we'd planned some conferences and we hope to have these conferences now that we can re, redo them. We, we're probably gonna have the first one at the, at the uh, University of Durham in the UK and probably the second one at Oxford. Uh, so if you people are interested in, in this question, stay in touch with me and because uh, uh, I think this is, this is a really significant question. With that, uh, let me stop and say, I think that the nearest star system and the ones beyond are really exciting. And, you know, some of you will probably live long enough to see us send stuff there. So thank you. Happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. Uh, you mentioned that if we're going to send uh, the sales, we're going to send many of them because yeah. some of them will damage. So if you send many, you need a lot of different, different laser. Is your, you can use the same beam for many. We would use the same beam. Uh, we would fire it every few days. So you'd send every few days. So you might do this for a couple of years. Now, that's a very interesting question about many beams. Uh, our, uh, our system engineer has just written a paper where he says, you know, if you take what we're trying to do and expand it and think about, uh, can I build a whole series of very large lasers? Uh, he believes that using lasers, we could send, you know, probes, not 10, 20% of the speed of light, but maybe 5%. Uh, that would be big, that would be, you know, you know, hundreds of tons. Uh, and he thinks that these could be human spaceships, that in a human lifetime you could get there. And uh, again, of course, how do you stop at the other end? But that's where the fusion comes in. So interestingly enough, I think James Cameron might have had the, the way you can, you can send probes. But you would have a whole string of these things either around the planet or probably more likely in space. Uh, he, he said the modest cost of this is a few trillion dollars in current terms now I okay that's a lot of money but you know we blew that on COVID in a few you know six months so you know I'd, I'd rather spend it on going to the stars than than fooling around with masks and stuff but that's that's my opinion I uh, thank you very much for the lecture yeah. I wanted to ask about the uh, chipsets if they're so small in size what kind of sensors could fit on them and what could we do with data of that type of resolution thank you. well th that's a really good question and and we had a couple workshops on that uh, it turns out it's pretty easy to put a camera on them. You know, the camera in your in your iPhone is, you know, light enough. Uh, but the question is, you need an optical system to focus it. Uh, so what we're looking at is using the sail itself as an optical element, or at least a central part of it. And uh, we have developed some geometries and technology that seems to make that work. So the most fundamental system is a camera, uh, and you can probably do some multispectral, you know, information, uh, you know, by changing the wavelength sensitivity of the of the of the of the chip or the camera uh, we think it might be possible to do a low resolution resolution spectrograph uh, the big problem is how to get the data back uh, and we think with technology we can imagine uh, you could get back you know maybe a few hundred bits per second so it would take years to get the uh, you know a handful of images back but that's more than we have today. Uh, but, but, you know, this chipset technology looks really exciting for exploring our own solar system. And, uh, you know, you could imagine hundreds or thousands of these things dropped on an asteroid or on Mars or someplace uh, to look for, look for life. And you have very simple sensors on each one of them. So it's, an it's a distributed uh, sensor capability. Hello, Professor. Uh, thank you for the lecture. I just had one question. Uh, the lasers which will be used for sailing, uh, will, they, will they not be affected by uh, interstellar dust or any obstructions like that? And if yes, then how are we going to prevent it? Well, the, the thing is, you only fire the laser for the first hour or so. So once you've pushed it to 20% the speed of light, it's, it's, it's uh, on coast for the rest of the way. Uh, the, uh, the, the light sail itself, as it goes through interstellar space, uh, there, there's not much material there, but it, interestingly enough, at 20% the speed of light, there's enough gas that you actually would heat one side of the sail relative to the other. Uh, and we think it's enough that we can pull power off it. So that may solve some of our problems. But if we hit a piece of dust, it'll put, uh, punch a hole in it. 
So we, we have to figure out some way that we don't destroy the chip. And we're looking now not at a single chip anymore, but distributing the, uh, the, the, the functionality across this entire you know, thin film. So it's, it's, it's chip sat probably isn't the right word. It's a, the ultimate flat sat, you know, it's a, you know, maybe, you know, you know, fraction of a millimeter, you know, maybe a few tens of microns and uh, thickness, but, you know, 10 meters in diameter. I have two questions here. Um, can we build the laser on the moon? And then the second question is, is it possible to make this project a tribute to humanity and maybe send 183 chipsets in order of the in honor of the United uh, of the 183 UN member states. Well, those are both very good questions. The the uh, uh, what's the first one again. <laughs> oh yeah, yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, the 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 person who wrote the key design for this is Professor uh, Phil Lubin at uh, UC Santa Barbara, and his proposal was putting. The, the lasers on the moon. And one of the ideas is putting them on the far side of the moon. There's always a worry if you build big lasers on the earth, they could be used as weapons. Uh, but putting on the far side of the moon has a couple advantages. One, it could be it could be made work in all directions. And second, that laser is big enough that if we had a threatening asteroid, we could divert it. And so it's, it, it's a very exciting effort. I think the second question about you know, having one for each member state is a great idea. And, uh, uh, you know, was, you know, hopefully I'll be around when we launch them, but I think that there may be different numbers of states then. But, but I think that, uh, you know, these things will be affordable enough so that, you know, each country, you know, or other organizations could actually have a, you know, have one that goes uh, interstellar. Well, the, the chips are cheap. I mean, maybe a few hundred dollars. And the power is not. You know, if you figure out how much power that each one of these launches will be five, ten million. But you know, I mean, over that's pretty cheap compared to, you know, Artemis, for example. <laughs> yeah, I have another question about uh, so with the Earth's atmosphere, so you have uh, some divergence of the beam. Huh? So it's like about one arc second. Uh, so you lose in efficiency. No. Because we, th th these are adaptively optically controlled. Uh, each of each is yes. in, in, in fact, the, I, I didn't get into a lot of the details, but the, the, the current idea is we'll, we'll probably use very small laser diodes or potentially some te a technology that's actually in your cell phone called VEX cells. And so these are basically phased array optical elements. And there's a beacon that we would have on the, on the sailcraft. And the beacon can be used to correct the atmospheric perturbations. So you actually exactly counteract the phase errors in the atmosphere in a fraction of a second. Uh, this is a perfected technology. It's, it's basically used for imaging today through the atmosphere. Uh, I have to say it was perfected by an organization I used to work for, you know, called the United States Air Force for some other purpose I won't get into, uh, but uh, uh, not to send starships out. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, that's, that's a key thing. Is it, 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 That's one of the problems that we solved and the key method of solving it was actually developed at the Australian National University in one of our contracts. And a question also about the Noah's Ark because at uh, ISU we had worked on the concept of the Noah's Ark on the moon uh, to preserve uh, some of the old uh, uh, patrimony of uh, genes from, uh, uh, from uh, the earth. So, okay, so could there be some synergy in what we select for Lunar Noah's Ark and what you sent to well, there, the there, stars? There, there, that's a very good, and that sort of gets to this this ethics question. One thing, of course, you could encode information on these chips. Now, these chips aren't going to stop. They're going to keep going. Uh, but there may be ways to to have them slow down enough they could enter the atmosphere of a of a of another you know another planet. And so this leads to the question of what if you wanted to plant life there, our life. Now, the ethical question is, how do you know there isn't life there already? Uh, but uh, the, uh, that seems to be doable. And that's what uh, George Church was talking about, how to, how to do that. Uh, there's a, uh, there's, a, there's a, a special issue of astrobiology that deals with this question of a word I won't mention, uh, that uh, Chris McKay and I and Paul Davies uh, co-edited. 
and uh, the paper that that uh, that uh, Chris and I and Davies wrote in it, we've suggested a way to do this, uh, not fast but slow. But if you had one of these interstellar comets, that uh, and, and there's probably a lot of them, that was kind of more or less going in the right direction, you could redirect it, but you would plant what we called an inoculum in it. That, that could be tailored life. And so then when it gets in the other star system, it melts. And so this stuff is scattered in the, that star system and then it would rain down on planets and, and begin to ignite life. Now, that's exciting, but it's also ethically dubious. So uh, we, we hope to ignite, you know, rather than to do a project like that, ignite the discussion on this. So it's because that's really one of the key questions about space. What is the ethics in philosophy of, you know, is it appropriate for us to spread our life to other planets, particularly if they may be life bearing, you know, in some way themselves. So I, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting topic. And I, a little more about that. We were planning some ethics conferences and, and we thought we'd invite people from a lot of different areas, including theology, that might have thought about that. So uh, I think that'll be fun stuff and uh, argumentative. Uh, it's a perfect thing for ISU to look at is the ethics. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, I wanted to ask if uh, is there any plans? Maybe some of the question uh, uh, is repeated by uh, the question that you just answered, but it seems like that we have, uh, it will be much more easier to us to just send life before or play with the atmosphere or create life in other planets than to send ourselves to distant stars. So are there any plans of doing that or? Well, well th that's the fundamental question. If you do want to, you know, say we find something in the Alpha Centauri system that 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 might be potentially habitable, but we, from our measurements, we show it's not inhabited. The, the, and, you, and one of the things Stephen Hawking wanted to do, he said, eventually we need to spread to the stars for survival anyhow. And if we agree with that, uh, then there's two ways to do it. One is that that you 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 somehow send this inoculum. You send you know, microbes or something that, that can boot up life. Uh, the, uh, one of the ideas that, that, that I've heard toyed with is that you send a, a uh, uh, you know, a, a 3D printer that prints out genomes. And then you also build a, a receive antenna so you can send, you know, huge amounts of data and then it boots up life there. Uh, another one is just send out these inoculum. Uh, and then, of course, the other extreme is you send starships that that actually have you know full of it and i don't know where it's going to go and if, if anywhere uh I, I do think it's important to, to think about you know beyond our solar system and expanding life and perhaps civilization and uh, you know of course one of the other things is that that maybe we're all going to be downloaded into machines so you just send a machine there so who knows but it's it's fun stuff Hello, thank yeah. you for the very interesting lecture. Uh, my question is related to the chiplets you want to send on the sails. Would they still work once you get there? I mean, would they resist the, the radiation or would you build them in a special manufacturing process to, to be radiation hardened? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question, but we think that, you know, from what we know from radiation interstellar space, these can be hardened enough that they can survive the, is mostly galactic cosmic rays. Uh, one of the technologies that people have looked at are self-healing electronics, that uh, there's enough sophistication in electronics so that, that if, you, if you get a cosmic ray hit, the, the, there's enough sophistication that wires its way around that. Now, after a certain number of, of hits, you, you, you're not survivable. Probably what we would do is have nearer term missions to near interstellar space there may be the Oort cloud and the and the Kuiper belt that would begin to be able to test this. But, you know, that is a key question. But we don't think from what we know about interstellar space that there's so much debris or dust or so much radiation that we can't survive that with technology, we understand. Great. Time for a beer, I guess, right? Thank you.
Right, Pete, thank you very, very much for this very interesting talk. Every year, uh, there's no more content into it. That's, that's really great to listen. All right, with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, another event that I want to announce before closing tonight is our team project presentations, which is indeed a great flow after this event, because this year's topic that the online team is working on is the new new methodologies for search for life and they are currently working on this topic for five weeks this is their final week to finish all their deliverables and the final final uh, their deliverable actually is the presentation on friday which will be a live event uh, and everyone who is watching online we also encourage you to be there so 2 p.m portuguese time so they will be giving a presentation which will be followed by an assessment and q a session by our assessors but not only and you can also ask questions online with that please write this on your agendas new methodologies search for life Friday at 2 p.m. Portuguese time. Until then, stay safe, stay with space. Take care. <laughs>